Hello, everybody, and welcome to this webinar. Um, it's really fantastic to have um, such high numbers of people joining, and I think that really demonstrates just the uh, interest and um, importance of this topic to so many people. We're going to structure this webinar like this. I'm going to kick off um, just talking for a few minutes, setting the scene, I suppose, and describing our experience to date of implementing innovative technology into our processes. I'm then going to hand over to James Thomas, who's going to talk more specifically about generative AI, because let's face it, that's what we're all very keen to hear about. And then I'm going to hand over to Ella Fleming, who will describe Cochrane's strategic plan around establishing guidance for the responsible use of AI in evidence synthesis. And finally, I hope we have timed things well enough so that we will have time to answer a few questions. But as Rachel said, if any questions remain unanswered, um, the three of us will write a, a written response and add this to the, to the webinar uh, recording. So without further ado, let's begin. So first up, I thought it might be just helpful to have a little think about what we mean by artificial intelligence. I think it probably means different things to different people. Um, it is a bit of an umbrella term and, of course, one much bounded about at the moment. I personally find the term automation more helpful because I think what we're really talking about are ways to automate tasks and activities currently performed by humans. But whatever we call it, AI automation, it obviously isn't new. Um, this graphic illustrates the 70 year plus development pathway, starting with things like text analytics and rule based systems, moving on to natural language processing, and then of course supervised machine learning, and finally generative large language models such as GPT. And for us in Cochrane, we've been actively engaged in using automation, particularly in the form of machine learning, for around a decade now. And so machine learning in this context is the building of supervised machine learning classifiers or models uh, from high quality training data that can distinguish between different classes of things. So, for example, distinguishing between reports of randomized controlled trials or non-randomized controlled trials. And these classifiers work really well for certain types of problems and probably less well for others. And they work well in instances where there is a clear question and definite answer, and where the training data has been highly representative of the data the classifier will tackle when deployed to a live environment. And as many as you, of you will know, uh, over the last few years, we've built and implemented a number of machine learning classifiers in Cochrane. Most well known will be the RCT classifier, but additionally other study type classifiers, COVID classifiers, PICO related classifiers too. And these classifiers have been deployed at the study identification stages of evidence production. And the way in which we've implemented most of them is as binary classifiers. So that means that rather than just having scores or predictions on records, we've calibrated the models and introduced cut points, and that's represented by this dotted line here. And what the cut points mean is that we can then triage the records automatically. So, for example, records that fall below a certain cut point can be automatically discarded. As you can see here, that would account for quite a lot of records. And records that score above a certain cut point perhaps need manual verification. And it's probably fair to say that these classifiers haven't changed the review production paradigm, but they have made a significant impact in terms of our ability to help keep central, Cochrane's central register of controlled trials and other study repositories up to date and well fed. And they've also brought efficiency to study identification for reviews through their implementation in our Screen for Me service. 
our experience with implementing machine learning classifiers has taught us a lot. And it's this aspect that I want to highlight now because the development of innovative technology and its successful implementation are two different things. We can all see the benefit or that we can all see the potential of generative AI. What we need to know now is how to make the most of it. And of course, this starts with recognizing new potential automation capability. And in the case of the machine learning classifiers, robust evaluations of performance were critical and helped us understand the role that machine learning could play. Certain key performance metrics needed to be included in those evaluations and of paramount importance to us was recall, but we were also interested in things like workload reduction, uh, generalizability of the evaluation results and any limitations or reasons behind possible weak points. And so for example, in the machine learning classifiers, we wanted to sort of one potential weak point was that perhaps it wouldn't work so well on records where it was only given a title to work with rather than a title and an abstract. And James is going to talk more on the importance of getting evaluations of these automation tools right. Another key question for us in terms of implementation was where precisely in the study identification process does this new technology or capability sit best? For example, are we talking about replacing all manual screening of title and abstracts with binary classifiers? And no, we're not talking about that because they're not accurate enough to replace all human involvement in the task. But at certain cut points, they are accurate enough to reduce the noise without throwing out relevant studies. There can be many ways that a tool can be implemented. And we've implemented classifiers in a, a deliberately safe way because of our need to prioritize recall over precision. And this just underpins the fact that a key part of being able to successfully implement autom automation is really about understanding its limitations and balancing those against a clear understanding of what the outputted data is going to be used for. And another area of consideration for us was around the technical or practical implementation. And this involved considering who should be able to use the classifiers and how. What expertise level is needed to use the technology? How and what guidance or support on the use could or should be provided? What flexibility should be enabled for tailoring use? For example, enabling users to shift the cut point or change the recall, the expected recall level? And how do we manage versioning and updating of the tool? And in the case of the classifiers, we implemented them into our own software called the Cochrane Register of Studies. And we provided access primarily to Cochrane information specialists who were trained to use them effectively. But then another key area was around endorsement and approval for use within Cochrane reviews. Obviously, we need to ensure appropriate endorsement by Cochrane groups, for example, methods, certain methods groups, review groups, approval by Cochrane. And in the case of the RCT classifier, we sought and received IRMG approval, so the Cochrane Information Retrieval Methods Group. And so now there's a new kind of AI automation in the form of generative large language models. And it's these that are dominating the discussions now, and rightly so. I don't think I can think of an equivalent technical innovation that offers so much promise or indeed potential to disrupt in this space. And things are moving rapidly. When ChatGPT3 came out in late 2022, I think this experience shown here was probably quite common to most, that initial wow, uh, followed by kind of hang on, a realization that actually uh, it's not going to solve all the problems. 
But then moving up to a kind of, okay, actually, I'm beginning to understand what it can do and what it can't do. And then to a point where, yeah, now I really understand where and how we can make the most of this technology. And so even since ChatGPT3, things have moved on significantly uh, with a range of LLMs now out there and accessible. Um, and with the ability to fine tune them, except it, you know, and so on. And so on that note, I'm going to now hand over to James, who's going to take a deeper look at some aspects of what I've touched on, as well as generative AI and considerations around what we need to do to ensure sensible and safe use of it.